Choosing the right rifle scope is paramount to your overall experience in the field or at the range. In this podcast, we cover features, price versus performance ratios, common misconceptions, and a whole lot more. More features and more expensive may not necessarily be better. Give this podcast a listen to find your next best rifle scope. All right, everybody, Mark and I are joined across the table by the ever infinitely knowledgeable Mr. Ryan Muckenhern. And today, he's going to talk with us a little bit about rifle scopes. Now, we've had, if you're a newer, newcomer to this podcast, or if you've been listening on and off, but uh, still kind of in the infancy of your shooting slash hunting career, and you've thought to yourself that you'd like to get more into the optic side of things, um, but you're not really sure what rifle scope to get for your rifle. Um, this is a question we get all the time. It's probably the most asked question we ever get on social media, on the phones, which Ryan, you're on the phones and emails and stuff into, uh, you know, the Vortex Optics main inbox and, you know, customer service that people ask these questions all the time. So kind of going to do a dedicated podcast to choosing the right rifle scope. And again, once you listen to this, if you feel like you've got a good grasp on it, go back and then listen to some of our other podcasts where we've talked about, I mean, obviously it's Vortex Optics here, so we've talked a lot about optics over the course of these last 100 plus episodes. Um, So listen to some of the long range ones, figure out what discipline you're most interested in, and there's probably something out there for you. But this is going to be very much more general, hunting and shooting. And uh, yeah, so, you know, one thing that we discussed before hitting that record button here, is, uh, you know, Ryan, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Usually somebody calls up and they say, I have X gun chambered in this, going to be used, I think, for this, or sometimes they don't even necessarily know that exactly. You know, they say, what rifle scope do I need? Well, if they didn't specify, you know, exactly what they're going to be using it for, the first question is, what are you going to be doing with it? Yep. Um, And, and, that is, we could go into, you know, if you're this kind of person, you should look for this kind of rifle scope. And if you're that kind of person, you should look for that kind of rifle scope. But I think that we'd be remiss to sort of skip over the topic of figuring out what you're going to do, mostly. Yeah. Maybe you already have the gun, or maybe you haven't even gotten the gun yet, but you know you want to do hunting, or you know you want to do shooting. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of it's kind of complex. I think... There are sort of, um, uh, how do I, there's things that people see online on social media or they see other people doing, maybe it's even on TV or whatever, that they think, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. You know, but then there's maybe a little bit of real reality that needs to be coming into play. Like, let's consider where you are in the country. What mm-hmm. ranges do you have nearby or what hunt opportunities do you have nearby that you'll actually be able to go on? It's kind of uh, it's kind of something I see people get caught in a lot is yes. actually trying to figure out exactly what it is that they're going to be doing. Yep. How do you start someone out with that? What so, would you say? I'd love to say that there's like a, a formula for doing this and it's like a check the box kind of thing, but every individual is going to be different. So if a guy or gal calls up, <clears throat> they're like, I need to pick out a new rifle scope for my X firearm, uh, whatever it's going to be. As you stated, I, w- there is some checklisting that you'll do geographically where are you at what kind of shooting do you plan on doing what kind of shooting have you done um and then budget budget's a huge thing that i ask a lot of people too and it's i think something maybe people tiptoe around because maybe it's an embarrassing question or it's a personal question but we don't want to come across as like how much you got right you know yeah more important to us is are we getting you into an optic that's a good value for you um, you know, if, if somebody calls and they're like, well, what rifle scope do you recommend for long range target shooting? I'm just going to shoot steel and paper. Um, I don't know that I'm doing that customer, uh, service. If I say, well, you want the gen two razor four and a half to 27. I mean, this is a $2,400 rifle scope. Um, it will certainly do the job. Absolutely. But is it the best fit? Correct. Where is it, you know, if, if they had picked up a, say a Ruger American predator, and they're going to consume two to three boxes a month of ammunition. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think we're doing them a great service to tell them that's the scope to get. I think we're trying to take their money. That's not really what we're about here. I think maybe if I was going to recommend something like the Diamondback Tactical, 
you know, you're getting into a, a long range capable optic at, you know, three hundred and forty nine ninety nine. dollars mm-hmm. uh, There's a lot of money left over for ammo. Uh, yeah. You know, as, as that shooter uh, progresses in their, um, you know, skill base and, and uh, ability levels improve or otherwise, then we can look at, you know, maybe a different optic down the line. But well, Yeah, and you see that all the time because as you're getting into having somebody ask the question, okay, I want to do target shooting or something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whenever I go on, you know, forums or on the internet or on social media or whatever people ask that question all the time and the comments that you see coming in underneath it's always it blows my mind because you'll have people where they're saying you know um you got to get the razor like if you you get the razor you you, you get the razor you might as well not get anything else right and that's just that that doesn't help anybody it doesn't because it implies that if you don't have a lot of money you can't play this game right and, you know, if you're going to go and get the, the cheap thing, you know, quit being poor or whatever. I mean, that's a that's a classic comment that people throw out there. And then all of a sudden you Just have stop it. Then all of a sudden you have somebody who's probably, you know, relatively new to this. Yeah. And they're thinking, well, geez, you know, I'm not rolling in it, so I can't do this, right. which is completely false. Right. It's not even remotely close to true, especially right. in the year 2020 at the time of this recording, at least when technology has come as far as it's come. This is something I use as a parallel all the time, and it's not cars, uh, but it. <laughs> I know, right? But back when, back when I remember being in, you know, grade school, yeah. you'd go over to a buddy's house for a sleepover. Everybody was rocking tube TVs, right? You know, if somebody had a thirty-inch tube TV, it was like everybody was floored, you know. And then all of a sudden, one buddy went and their parents got the 35-inch plasma screen TV. And you had to be real careful because if you paused video games on it, you couldn't pause it for too long, you'd burn the image into the screen. Really? By golly, that was a 35-inch plasma screen TV, and it probably cost about five grand. And now you go in on Black Friday, and they've got like 45-inch LCD screen TVs in 4K on sale for 300 bucks. That's just what happens as technology advances. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm already getting uh, on my on my soapbox here, already getting heated a little bit. But but to your point, Ryan, mm-hmm. you're not doing a service when you're somebody who, and, and it, a lot of times it comes from people with what they think is good intentions because yeah. they've probably rose through the ranks of yep. scope. Mm-hmm. They started out with the Diamondbacks, you know, and they went to the PST and then yep. they got the Razor and now their eyes have been opened to how amazing it is to get the Razor and they just think everybody should just get a Razor, you mm-hmm. know, but it's like, let's pump the brakes. Yep. You know, that's not always necessary. No, and I think more often than not, it's not necessary. <clears throat> I, uh, I look at my own personal loadout, like what, what I use for hunting or what I use for long-range target shooting, and I do take in the same considerations as I would if I was if I had a brand new customer on the phone. Like they are new to this, they watched a YouTube video on shooting long range. They thought this is a lifestyle I need to get into. I take I I take that into you know my own um, sales pitch to myself when I'm picking out an optic. Um, I can tell you I own a lot more Viper HSs than I own Razor LH and and now the new LHDs. And there's yeah, and you a reason. work here. Yeah, and there's a reason for that, and it's. Um, with optics, like with any technology, whether it's a digital technology like the telephones that you're talking, or telephones, excuse me, t- uh, TVs that you're talking about, um, or vehicles or, or computers or whatever, there's a point of diminishing returns. And we've talked about this on, on this podcast before, where you, you'll plateau um, in which you're, you're getting dollar for dollar this great performance and value only briefly, and then you have this exponential curve of um, dollars put in for incremental gains, right? Mm-hmm. Where we're paying exceptionally more money um, for not a huge gain in optical or mechanical performance. Um, so I, I, I like to try to suss out with a customer where that plateau is for them. Yeah, And it does. It, we go back to um, you know what they're doing with it, where they are, what mm-hmm. their expectations are. Um, versus what the reality is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, we get to go to a lot of these, uh, like, shows, if you will, trade shows, and some of them are consumer-facing, some of them are, are dealer shows, but the consumer shows are really kind of my favorite. So we go there, and you get folks come up to the, uh, the booth, and they're like, oh, I'm looking for a new rifle scope. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start elk hunting. Uh, I'm from, you know, Virginia. Uh, you know, we've got a 200 yard range, uh, within 60 miles of my house, but I want to come out here to Wyoming and I want to hunt elk. Um, so do I need a six to 24? 
um, they get they get on television or they get on the internet and they see these folks that have these huge scopes on top of their hunting rifles and they're shooting ridge top to ridge top. Um, my short answer to that shooter is no. You do not need a six to twenty four. We need to talk about what kind of shooting you've done, what kind of rifle you're putting it on. Um, well, I think some of that stuff is deceiving, right? Because the person yeah. says, man, I'm going out west. I want to be yeah. able to make a good shot. I want to be accurate. Yep. So then you start maybe doing some research, and you're like, oh, man, long-range precision. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not going to be actually doing th those things, right? But I want to be that precise. Right. But some of those features and, and you know, magnification range and performance qualities don't necessarily translate over to this individual's. No application right. you know right. you, you look at um sometimes sometimes price you know an increased price and maybe even increase in features it's not it's just not practical mm -mm. for the for for what actually is going to be done with right. the optic right. right right and a lot of that uh, you hit the nail on the head right off the or right off the bat in the and when we started the, this podcast is is you get on the internet and you start reading forums and you start reading what people tell you you need to have. Mm -hmm. And you do get this, um, I'm just going to say, misconception as to what is yeah. the necessary product. Well, what everybody thinks you need. Yeah. What, what everybody says you need and, and, and they say that somehow it exists, but it, it quite honestly doesn't, mm -hmm. uh -uh. is a scope that does everything. Yep. And it's a scope that, you know, oh, when I'm at my range, I can enjoy it at 100 yards. I can take it out west hunting in the mountains. And then I can take it to a PRS match and shoot out to 1,200 yards with it really accurately. Mm -hmm. And then I can take it to the Vortex Extreme. But then I can take it up in my tree stand at home out east and shoot a deer at 70 yards with it. Yeah. And then I can, you know, I mean, and then I can throw it on my AR and it's a three gun. I mean, it's like, you can't. It, right. it, that doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> and so dispelling the uh, myths or misconceptions as to what you, quote, need in an optic actually should probably be number one uh, on my checklist. Maybe I'll start my, my spiel over when I do have folks call up is, well, what have you read? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think you need, I guess? And, and we'll go from there. Um, because it is tricky. It, it is tricky. And, and uh, understanding perhaps what some of the the things on a rifle scope mean like when you're when you're looking at a catalog from us or from anybody in the industry like deciphering what these numbers mean and what they provide you or limit you with as a shooter uh, magnification is a huge one um, mm -hmm. for me matching magnification to application is is very very important and in in today's society i've said this before in the u.s we like big jacked up trucks with knobby tires whether we take them off road or not is another story i see a similar trend with rifle scopes i see a lot of folks over scoping their guns totally um, for for their application and and this is speaking you know more towards hunters and we'll get into the the multi-gun or the competition crowd next but to hunters um, you know, it's kind of the, the group I most identify with or most closely identify with. Um, the tendency is to overscope. And I see a, a residual effect here where when you go up in magnification, typically you go up in cost. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden folks are like, well, I want, I think I need a 6 to 24. Usually it's out of fear. Yeah. It's like FOMO. Yeah. Fear of missing out. Yep. You if, know? if you didn't have it, you were somehow going to... That's why you like I big mag it. scopes, Mark. I Because you, you have debilitating debilitating FOMO. I do have debil debilitating FOMO. However, I do agree with Ryan that uh, a lot of rifles get overscoped for the application. And yeah. I think, and you're probably going to get into this, but it's not only that you just have more than you need. You're like, well, I've got the extra if I need it. It's actually can be at the detriment yeah. of yes most of the ways you're going to use that rifle. Like, I love I love the six to twenty four HSLR. Am I going to use it in Wisconsin? No, because I don't want a low end of six power. No. Have you used that one in Wisconsin? No. Okay. I've used the four to sixteen a lot. I was always wondering. Not to if mention you have a low end of six power with something else we can dive into too. First but it's focal first plane. focal plane, yeah. and everybody and everybody says, you know, oh my gosh, if it's not first focal plane, it's obsolete. You might as well just throw it in the dumpster. Right. But it's like when you have a scope, you know, and, and again, like you said, oh well, at least I can go up to twenty four, but I've got six on the low, and that's good enough for me around town, or you know, or not around town. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's my uh, that's my car lingo. Coming I was going to say that's your, uh, that's your town that's, cruising yeah, that's gear my, right there. Uh, daily yeah, driver. It's your daily yeah. driver, my, my fault. No, that's that's good enough for me in the woods or something like that around Wisconsin. 
but but then you consider, you know, oh, but it has to be first focal plane. And now when you're going down and that's that's a non-illuminated scope even, the reticle, it appears to be so small on those low on the lowest yeah. power. I mean, we've lost that battle woods, instantly. In the woods, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you're not even gonna be able to pick up the reticle at all. Yeah. And and anyway. then and that's that is like the case in point, right? So they, they look at the catalog, they see six to twenty four K needed, because otherwise if I don't have it, I'm not gonna be able to shoot this elk deer antelope at at probably what is going to be a modest distance. Um, then they see this, the price tag. So like looking at that HSLR that Mark mentioned, that's a thousand dollar rifle scope. That's mm-hmm. a lot of coin. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the cost of the hunt. If you're driving from Wisconsin here, plus your tag, plus your food, plus your gas. Uh, so they see that and they're like, well, shoot, that's a, I don't think I'm going to be able to sneak that one into the budget. So then they say, well, I still want six to 24, but I'm going to go down a few tiers in optics. Um, and then I'll be okay, right? Because they still have six to 24, but I'm going down a tier. And that's fine. But again, we need to now consider application. So let's say we jump down to, we'll just, we'll go to the extreme end. We go to the Crossfire 2, 6 to 24 by 50 adjustable objective. Mm-hmm. Um, our entry level high magnification scope. Um, we're still at 6 to 24. We're still at 50. To somebody not well-versed in a rifle scope, they look at these two things on paper, and they see same, same. Numbers yeah. are the same. They, they could One's lower price. Man, I'm ripping them off. The only, <laughs> right? The Idiots. only, the only thing, <laughs> the only thing in common that these rifle scopes share is their color, their magnification range, and the fact that they're Vortex Optics products. They couldn't be more different for use and and um, in optical quality, and. I'll be very upfront with this. I do not recommend that rifle scope for traditional big game hunting because it's a high magnification rifle scope, number one. Number two, it's got an adjustable front objective, which you may find tricky to use in the field, um, especially under the duress of your game animal appearing and then possibly disappearing. Uh, And then two, at high magnification, you need to start pouring on optical quality Mm -hmm. to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And then we get into focal plane. Well, it's a second focal plane optic. Its reticle is only accurate at one magnification. And then we got to start doing conversion math. I went to public school and drank cheap beer in college. I don't do math well. So even as somebody who runs a lot of rifle scopes on a daily basis, if I'm running a second focal plane rifle scope that has a, uh, a subtension magnification at 18 or 24x and I turn it to 14, I have no idea what to do with my hands. <laughs> well, like, where, where does my reticle sub 10 now? Uh, I would deem that an inappropriate optic for that hunter. Um, now, that individual called me up, said, hey, I'm getting into um, IR-50 air gun, or excuse me, rimfire competition, or I'm going prairie dog shooting, or I, I want to build a rock chuck gun, or I just want something that I can punch paper with. Um, I want a parallax that I can adjust. 6 to 24 crossfire all the way. Mm-hmm. Perfect yeah. option. Mm-hmm. Um, not not for the big game hunter for those reasons. So first thing, sussing out that that magnification need or that feature need, and, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is driven by mag. Um, at least that I see. A lot of the guys like we just got back from the Western Hunting Conservation Expo a few weeks ago in Salt Lake, and a lot of folks come up and they say, "I need that six to twenty four." Uh, first thing is like, okay, well, what kind of rifle are you shooting it on, and and how far are you comfortable shooting? Usually, it's a modest caliber, two seventy. Uh, 7 rem mag, 30 out 6, 308, uh, 65 Creedmoor. Uh, generally, the answer I get is I've shot to 300 yards, or I've shot to 400 yards. Um, 6 to 24 will certainly get you there. Uh, but understand that at that magnification, at last light or at first light, a lot of times when we see game running around, you're not in a good situation. Dial it back. If it's not a first focal plane, your reticle's off. If it's not illuminated, maybe you can't see your reticle. Like you said, Jim, shoot. That rules out that 6 to 24. Let's look at something different. Mm-hmm. So make sure the shoe fits. Um, and then, you know, we touch on it again, price. Uh, as we go up exponentially in magnification, we go up exponentially in cost to make sure that optics match. Well, now we've driven back up to that HSLR line. Well, let's find some common ground somewhere in the mid-tier. We're going to lower the magnification. We're going to be able to increase the optical quality, and we're going to find a balance between price and performance. Mm-hmm. And it's usually going to be in that three to nine, two and a half to 10, four to 12, four to 16 range in our line. And that goes from Crossfire to Viper HS. Yeah. And well, even, even the new LHT. And you can start giving up some features too. You do. That's the other thing. You don't always have to, 
the giving up magnification or going down in tears doesn't always have to mean um I shoot, I'm trying to figure out how I'm trying to word it. But for example, the HSLR has exposed an exposed elevation turret. Yep. It has parallax adjustment as first focal plane. Those are also some of the things that make it more expensive yep. too. Mm-hmm. Yep. And mm-hmm. so if you go down, let's say, a couple of uh tiers or levels to say the Viper uh, which is it's still in the Viper family, so actually it has very similar optical quality, yep. but features are another thing. So like the HS, on the 2.5 to 10, you're getting lower magnification. Usually you can cheat a little bit better optical quality or at least a little bit you know, um, better maybe low-light performance or something like that out of a, a scope with lower magnification. Um, but otherwise, same family as the Viper HSLR, so yep. same general level of optical quality. But now you've stripped away this, the exposed elevation turret, which mm-hmm. not everybody needs to dial their elevation turret. Some nope. people could do the old set it and forget it method. In fact, many people can do the set it and forget it method, um, i.e. zero your rifle scope and then use the BDC reticle to hold over or just shoot off the center crosshair. Um, and then... Uh, it doesn't have, in the case of the 2 to 10 there's no side parallax. It's second focal plane. All things yep. that make manufacturing that scope easier, I then, um, you know, thus making the cost of it go down. So you're still getting a really, really nice Viper quality optic. Mm-hmm. But now for, what is the, like, 2 to 10 4 to 16 go for under or so around four, 500 bucks? 4 99 for a 2 to 10 I okay. want to say it's 5 99 for the 4 to 16 Yeah. Yep. So and, there you go. You yeah. save yourself a bunch of money, and you're still in that same mid-high level rifle. Yes, spot. absolutely. Well, and on the surface, you know, with that extreme example you're talking about, Ryan, of like, oh, they're both 6 to 24, so yep. I'm going to... Where we've kind of transitioned to like, oh, maybe let's go this direction. Mm-hmm. On the surface, it might seem like, man, I'm giving up things or I'm losing things. Yep. Mm-hmm. But you're not. You're actually gaining the perfect rifle scope that's yep. going to perform optimally for what you're doing yeah. with it. And, exactly. and arguably better than if you were to go with that. Absolutely. Exactly. And I'll bring up one thing again. So you were talking about first focal plane a little yeah. bit earlier. So now the thing with first focal plane, second focal plane, and we do have an entire podcast on this that you can go back and listen to, but the, the gist of it is uh, first focal plane reticle, as you zoom in and out, it will appear that the reticle is growing and shrinking as you zoom in and out. That is because, in fact, actually the image, which Mm -hmm. is a separate thing from the reticle, is growing and shrinking, and the reticle is growing and shrinking at the exact same rate. So all those subtensions in there, all those hash marks and just any characteristic about the reticle, which corresponds to an MOA or MRAD value, that all has a scale in relation to the image size. So it has to grow and shrink with the image as the image grows and shrinks with magnification in order to maintain its proper geometry. A second focal plane optic, that's where you turn the magnification dial, you move it all over the place, and the reticle always looks the same. So it's funny because that means that because the image is changing all around that reticle and the reticle isn't changing with it, that actually means that its scale is changing in relation Mm -hmm. to the image. So that's where you get to the point where if I have a BDC reticle that's calibrated or I've figured out the ballistics such that my hash marks line up with my trajectory of my bullet at X distance, whatever... Um, in a second focal plane optic, there's one set magnification, usually the highest, sometimes not. You can check in your reticle manual. Uh, there's one set magnification where the scale all lines up, the stars have aligned, and then you can go ahead and use that. And all the rest of the magnifications, you can still use the center crosshair. It is a point in space. Points in space have no, uh, there's no ramifications of scale on points in space. Science. Science, the <laughs> physics, is all happening around us. But uh, anyway, you can still use the center crosshair. You can still dial and shoot off the center crosshair. All those things still work, uh, but you wouldn't be able to then easily use the, uh, the, the drops. So what we're getting around to is a lot of people nowadays, first focal plane has become much more popular, much more accessible. Big it, buzzword. Big mm-hmm. buzzword. Yep. Mm-hmm. And some people think, I, I know some people, the last thing that I got to, some people think that actually, in fact, a second focal plane optic is not usable on any power except one. Right. Right. If that were the case, we would only make them fix power optics. That would be otherwise it's just senseless to make it, it's just a telescope until right. one power up until that point. Um and uh but no, not the case. They are usable on all magnification levels. Again, a single point in space, your center crosshair does not change with scale, yada yada. Um but a lot of people get worried. And again, I think it's that fear. It's the fear of missing out. Yep. It is. It's a FOMO thing. Like other people have first focal plane. I hear you need it for long range shooting. Um, I might be doing long range shooting. So um, even though I'm going to be hunting most of the time, 
I'm really, I want to go with that first focal plane reticle just because, you know, again, it's like, uh, well, hey, at least I have it. And if right. I don't need it, then I don't, you know, it's fine. But actually, like, let's say in the case of the Razer HD uh, LHT just came out yep. at the time of this recording, fresh off the press. It's a 3 to 15 rifle scope, so relatively mid power. And it's a second focal plane optic. I know some people were a bit sort of bent out of shape about the fact that it wasn't first focal plane. And there are actually many cases, and in this particular configuration, it, it went through a lot of the development phase, and a lot, and in, in, in purposefully, we made it second focal yep. plane. Well, and and Jim, I'll say, like, I love, you know, this. I love, 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 love this scope, right? The yes, LHT, you do. The LHT, I'm pretty sure is. Yeah. It's. We're uh, just I mean, call uh, we more. already have one set aside to go in your casket someday. Wow. When we put you in the ground. Well, now uh, now, now I'm, not, I'm not predicting that's going to happen anytime soon. But we just want to set one aside in case, you know, Hopefully we're looking 40, ahead 50, long in whatever the years. Don't yeah, jinx me, Jim. They're, they're discontinued at that point. But I would have been, I mean, this scope, I, like I said, you want to go shoot blacktails creep through the timber? Great. You want to go shoot a deer at 600 yards? Great. Beyond whatever. I mean, this thing is so... Hey, you just want to shoot at the range. Versatile. You want to go shoot at the range. I would have been disappointed if we made it in first focal plane, I would have said, you know, like you said, a lot of people are like, man, I wish it was first. You know, this thing's got long range capability. It needs to be first focal plane. No, this thing is going to perform optimally in a second focal plane optical system for those reasons that mm -hmm. with, a, with a low end of three power, do you want a first focal plane reticle? That thing's going to look... teeny tiny. The even, whole, yeah. even with the illumination component. Even with the illumination. Right. But the whole point is too, the illumination in that scope is a center dot, yeah. which again doesn't matter then if it's right. first or second right. focal plane. Mm -hmm. and, maybe, and so and 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 the whole point of first focal plane is to be able to hold over in relatively rapid mm -hmm. uh tents mm -hmm. uh to be able to hold over on any magnification not have to think about what magnification you're on not have to do the math you were talking about mm -hmm. which is which is useful if you're let's say a PRS competitor maybe you have a stage that's going to have targets anywhere from 300 to you know 1000 yards mm -hmm. so you want to set your scope on one magnification cuz you're also on the clock mm -hmm. you don't want to fuddle around with your magnification mm -hmm. you want to be able to shoot the entire stage on 14 power and so your reticle in like a four and a half to twenty seven Gen two razor, for example, your reticle on fourteen power still plenty usable. It's plenty big. You can use it. Fourteen power, three hundred all the way out to a thousand. You're using holdovers. You don't have to touch the turret. It's wonderful, you know. Right. But then you look at like a three to fifteen power on a hunting scope. How often do you have like oh there's a deer at three hundred, there's a deer at five hundred, there's a deer at nine hundred, and I'm just I gonna gotta clean. <laughs> I gotta <laughs> clean this. <laughs> <day. laughs> Oofta. Uh, Popping tags. Right. <laughs> or, or I think at that point, you probably don't Whoa. have enough tags. Whoa. Uh, um, and that's a, a great point. Can we talk about uh, perhaps where the attributes or, or like lay out a scenario or explain why second focal plane is more useful than first? I, I think yeah. that's important because I feel like we've kind of been like dogging on first. Like you yeah. don't need, a lot of people certainly do need it. Just like you've yeah. been talking a lot about hunting lately. Yeah. You right. Know, you know? Or, I mean, at least at this point thus far. I, I also love first focal plane. I can generally make more cases for first focal plane than against it. If you audit my personal loadout of rifle scopes that I have mounted on guns for hunting, there are two first focal plane optics. There are more than 20 second focal plane rifle scopes. Mm -hmm. And that's very intentional uh, for, for all the reasons that, that, you had outlined, Jim. My my big thing to tell people is we'll just pick on the LHT because uh, it's, it's convenient in here in a hot topic. With a rifle scope at 15x, like you stated, modest magnification for 99% of the shots a hunter may take from, we're just going to say 100 yards mm -hmm. to 600 yards. That's my, my personal distance threshold, regardless of caliber or whatever. Um, 15x is doable. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, very much so. Intuitively, Absolutely. intuitively, at 15x, the subtensions are accurate. So if you do need to go out to distance, if it was less than the distances required for subtension use, so I'm going to say below our maximum point blank range where we would zero our rifles, mm -hmm. we don't need the subtensions. No. Turn the magnification down. Take advantage of the wider field of view, mm -hmm. the increased light transmission and, uh, and, and image brightness, um, and you're not using your subtensions anyways. Now, it's a second right. focal plane. Everything's fine. Point in space, like you said, hold on and hit. Um, I think this is spectacularly advantageous. Um, 
you know, the first focal plane in this, in this case, let's just say we made one for the shooters out there that say, it's got to be first. If you were to turn that reticle down, because those reticles scale, the center point, even though this is illuminated, would grow infinitely tiny and would, it would be so tiny yeah. you would you'd be able to see it even probably if it was illuminated right and in fact like you look at a scope like the new razor one to 10x yep. that's first focal plane right so that's that's one to ten power but the whole point and that reticle was designed this way yes. the whole reticle itself actually shrinks down so much at one power that the entire reticle almost becomes yep. a single point yep. just about yep. and just and then it just illuminates and it's like a red dot so three power isn't that much up from one. No. And that reticle is going to be tiny. I mean, it's almost going to be like a single tiny little point in space with just a bunch of little, you know, hash marks in it. Yeah. That you wouldn't even be able to make out. And for a lot of the shooters out there arguing that a rifle scope like this should be first focal plane, imagine us at the drawing board trying to make a usable reticle at 15X because we have to start there and yeah. then get smaller. Imagine what that reticle would look like with the illuminated component it would be huge. It would be like a dinner plate in the middle of your reticle mm -hmm. that when we scale down to 1X or 3X in this case, it would be usable. I think a lot of folks would be off put by the lack of, quote, precision feature in that reticle mm -hmm. in which we designed a rifle scope in the spirit of long range or longer range hunting or the capability to bring you to long range. Yeah, um, yeah it, would, it, would, it would take away. So, and that's not to say that there's not a chance for a first focal plane in something like that where it could work, but you look at the HSLR scope series yep. that we were talking about earlier, the 4-16 to 16 isn't a first focal plane. It's second focal plane for that reason. Right. The 6-24 to is a first focal plane. Yep. Yep. And uh, that's, a, that's a perfect example. You got two scopes in the same family, one's first, one's yeah. second, and, and they're designed for a little bit different application. And yeah. for, for the folks that have been following us for some time, we had a first focal plane 4 to 16 HSLR. We don't anymore. Gonzo. And the reason for that was the feedback that we got from hunters in the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. The reticle became very difficult to use at low end. And mm -hmm. I, I very rarely find myself cranked all the way up when I'm hunting in Wisconsin or Minnesota, where I'm from, even in South Dakota, when I'm out there chasing mule deer and antelope or Wyoming mule deer and antelope. Not often do you need to be on the highest. Mag. So I feel like 18, 18 power is kind of that threshold where a, the max a first focal plane reticle, yeah. you know, starts to yeah. come into play. Sure. as like a useful. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but so another thing people bring, and we're talking about specifically hunting again, because mm -hmm. if, if first focal plane had no point, we, we wouldn't make it. There's two, uh, I guess there's at least one first focal plane, no, two in front of us um, that are long range specific again you know there's many uses where it makes a lot of sense but another one that i hear hunters bring up and and this i'm back and forth on because could it happen yes would first focal plane help in this situation yes have i seen second focal plane work just fine in situations like these yes too so anyway they bring up the fact that you may come over a hill you come over a hill right and you kind of peek over and oh there's my chance you know and so the scope might be on who knows what magnification yeah. you don't have time to think about that necessarily you pull up the gun, it's far enough away, you've ranged it, that you do need to use a holdover. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you don't have time to uh, dial it, you know, which in the case of some scopes that have cap turrets would take a while. You got to get that cap off and then dial. At least with like an LHT, you have just a locking turret. You can flip up and dial if, if need be. But, you know, everything's kind of happening quick. And then you can, you know, in theory with the first focal plane, just be able to, able to hold over and shoot. Right. Um, but the one thing that I found then, too, is that that's not always the case. Probably rare. It, it is, right. yeah. And and I was thinking back to Nebraska when we shot uh, that whitetail mm -hmm. with a muzzle loader. This guy right here, actually. Yeah, good point. At 225 yards. And that thing was on a tear. I mean, he was sprinting from on a dead sprint from some hunters that had spooked him across this little dish that we were on the other side of. And we saw him come sprinting across, and there was enough time with a 4 to 16 second focal plane HSLR. There was enough time to get a range on where he, where he was. He stopped for a minute, uh, or not a minute, it was seconds. a matter of seconds, right? So he stops for a second. We had time to go in, figure out how much we needed to dial with a muzzle, muzzle loader at 225. You got to dial. Dialed up, but we had to. Got behind the scope, felt as though he was going to sit still for a long enough time to pull the trigger. Boom, sent one. And I mean, that was a that was a deer that was very much on high moving. alert, moving, moving. Yep. Uh, and 
And so anyway, there was enough time in that, even though you feel like there's just chaos happening in front of you, there's still time, Mm -hmm. you know, if you Mm got to dial. Um, And yeah, dialing, especially again, like I said, in a scope like the LHT with an exposed elevation turret, pull that up, make the dial real fast. Easy peasy. Yeah. Anyway, we've, we've gone on a tirade here a little bit about second focal plane and first focal plane. For somebody looking, and we'll transition into the shooting side of things, then we'll probably be singing the praises of first focal plane, but... Somebody looking for a hunting rifle scope, the consensus is, you know, don't let everybody think that if you get a scope that's, say, throw out there less than 500 bucks, that it's useless. You know, you don't have to go to massive high magnification for all the reasons we've just pointed out. You don't have to get every bell and whistle and feature in the book, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, again, you can, where would you say you need to place most of your precedence? Is it? Because because what I'm thinking and what I'm kind of going with this is that there are times where you can get incredible optical quality as long as you just give up some of the features that would have otherwise ordinarily added to the price of yep. the scope. Yep. Sure. So where I put my precedence is always optical quality. Um, and That's going to gain you opportunities. More, more than anything else. More than any dial, lever, illuminating component um, or bell or whistle optical quality will always win out for me and there's and that's not to say that you need to go buy the razor line because it's the best optic that we make that's not the case at all in fact i was going through my head the number of crossfires and diamondbacks that are considered quote entry level in our line that i own and use on a regular basis i would say those things there are entry points because i think entry the level is, is entry like level yeah there are entry level but like there are entry point because i think the term entry level people go oh that's like you know right like kids yeah. toy stuff and they're right. not so no there's a reason we don't go anywhere below that i mean that is right. our entry level that's where we feel mm-hmm. you can still get a good mm-hmm. i run a, a crossfire two one to four uh, by 24 on a slug gun when I hunt Minnesota. The illuminated one? I, it is illuminated. I nice. actually wish it was the standard V-Plex one yeah. just because I like that reticle a little bit better. Um, but the reason I run that particular scope is because at that with that particular gun and its, it's maximum capabilities, I, I, I mean, on the best day, I'd consider a 125-yard shot with that gun. And, and that's like best case scenario. Um, it's a Pump action, Remington 870, rifled barrel, cantilever barrel for shooting slugs. Um, I like the gun because it's light, handy, fast. If I'm going to hunt tough cover, dense cover, um, it's a great option for that. Putting any more scope on than that would be, in my opinion, a foolish move on my beh- my, my part because I'm, I'm going to be overscoping. Um, I'm going to be losing usability. And in the case of that rifle scope, at 1x, I, I I can drive it like a red dot. It is super fast. Okay. I think I think at that point that is the best optic for that application. And we do make better scopes than that. I could put a one to six razor on there. I'm not going to put a fifteen hundred dollar rifle scope on a four hundred dollar Remington eight seventy for hunting deer. Right. Um, yeah. So that's a great case in point. I've got a rimfire gun that I have set up just for shooting squirrels and rabbits. Well, people used to say you need to spend twice as much as you spent on the gun on the optic, and it's just not quite the case anymore. You can, again, I put a Razor 5-20 to on a Ruger American or ran the Vortex Extreme. The next year, I put a Diamondback Tactical 4-16 to on the Ruger American, ran the Vortex Extreme, and did better because I became a better shooter between those two competitions, Mm -hmm. even though I was running a scope that was $1,000 less expensive. And imagine if you were... If you were not somebody who worked at Vortex, but a, a regular guy, and you had to find somewhere to get your money elsewhere, or so, if you would have bought the Diamondback Tactical, saved all that cash, think of the think ammo. how much ammo you could have shot, and become a better shooter. And 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 the ammo that I did buy and yep. shoot in between those two Vortex extremes to become a better shooter that I then shot better at the next one with a $1,000 less expensive scope. That's what made me a better shooter. Damn it up. wasn't yeah. the fact that I got a different scope. <laughs> right. You get you should know that because right. I spent, you know, it's a $1,000 right. less. And I, well, and that, some of that circles back to one of your original points, Jim, when you're talking about like kind of this, this, this gap of quality and price, how it's kind of, I guess, narrowed over time. Yeah. You know, I think when maybe people started saying like, oh, you got to spend twice on the scope than the rifle, that was a different time. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, that that might have been an accurate statement sure. at the time. I would, you can get a, I would th- believe it. You could buy a good rifle scope for two to five hundred bucks. Yep. That's gonna suit you quite well. Yep. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, and I'm not talking like 
int- I mean, like, oh, oh, like the Viper HS series. I find that to be like the perfect blend of the perfect. Oh, I forgot the T. Uh, the perfect blend of like price and quality. Now, mm-hmm. I, I want to know is that do you finish that word with the C or a K? Perfect. Uh, I think it's like a CK maybe. C. It's just C. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, okay. Weird. Um, yeah. I do think it is important to bring up turret styles yep. with hunting yep. because you have cap turrets, you have exposed turrets. Um, a lot of people, again, will look and they'll think, oh, if I'm going to be shooting uh, you know, big game at potentially long ranges, I have to have an exposed turret. Mm-hmm. I can't exactly argue against it because it does help to be able to dial quickly, but at the same time, you just need to be aware yeah. that, that is a precision dial that is exposed now to... Everything you're walking through, hiking through, bumping up against, you know, putting the rifle in, taking it out of. I've been burned by exposed turrets uh, due to my own negligence. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing. Uh, well, we will grab the Diamondback Tactical. These turrets are made to dial up and dial down, dial left, dial right. And if you if you have, uh, I, I guess, a good idea of where you're at in your travel range, mm-hmm. just dial back to the zero and you're fine. I failed to check where I was at in my travel range, uh, which, which flubbed me a shot. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the, I'd, I'd say with something like that, it's like, look at, um, look at the consequence, mm-hmm. like the consequence of, you know, uh, maybe, uh, missing paper versus missing the game animal right. of a lifetime. Right. You know, when we're on the range, yes. we do a lot of long range shooting together. And so we always like take for granted how quick a follow up shot can happen on, a steel target. Like, oh, Mark, you missed a 6 MOA to the right. Correct for that. Yeah, target didn't move. Yep. Just a quick holdover, pull the trigger, bang, on. It's like, wow. Gosh, we should be really proficient when we're in the field. When I'm hunting anything, it's way completely different feeling than when I'm shooting steel. Like, I'm hyped up and nervous and that kind of thing. And, and of course, the, like you said, Jim, the steel doesn't have a tendency to run away. Um so yeah, the dials are they're cool. They look great. Again, you're not missing out if you don't have one. So if the FOMO mm-hmm. takes over, just let that rest. Um, well, let's ask yourself: you Are s- you going to go through the process of getting right. your ballistic data yep. to be able to use the ty- the dial how it's intended? Yeah, there's and if a- the answer is yes, mm-hmm. yep, get it. You can still dial this. Yep, and you know, and we have. Uh, I know a lot of guys that run capped turrets, myself included, and have dialed them to take shots and do so accurately. It's the same function. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. If you see the dial on there, uh, it mm-hmm. looks appealing because it, it seems like it's going to make the optic more proficient. Well, we build reticles for that too, the dead hole BDC. Yeah. Uh, with modern cartridges, um, even even something as slow and uh, antiquated as a 308, right? Um, <laughs> they That reticle is designed to bring you out ethically on game to about the maximum you'd want to shoot it. And like a 308, it's a 500 yard reticle. That's as far as I'd personally want to go. So mm-hmm. I don't need a dial. Um, yeah. Well, and then, you know, and then you got scopes now, again, like the LHT that came out where mm-hmm. you kind of get the best of both worlds and exposed turret, but it's locking. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so there isn't as much risk nearly. You Capped know, involved. windage, super uh, yep. sleek. Yeah, exactly, with bumping that thing around. But again, when you talk about features, and sometimes people will lay out, uh, this is another thing that happens when they ask about a rifle scope, they, they'll lay out a list of features that they want, probably, mm-hmm. again, given to them by the internet, you mm-hmm. know. I want an exposed elevation turret locking with a zero stop, with parallax adjustment, with amazing optical quality, great low light performance. I want, you know, this, that, this, that, um, you know, a really nice glass hatch reticle that has all kinds of features all over it, uh, illumination. And you did just describe the LHT. I did describe the LHT, uh, but then they'll say, you know, and I'm looking to spend, and this isn't to shame anybody, but, you know, if they say, and I'm looking to spend less than 300 bucks. I'm I'm not shaming anybody, like no. I said, it, because that's fine. If your budget's three hundred bucks, I've had a budget of three hundred bucks plenty of times in the past, or or lower even. And I run a crossfire on a couple of different things that I have. Crossfire Red Dot here is something that's one hundred and fifty bucks for a perfectly good sighting system with one yep. X. But um, there are times where you just need to realize that if you're going to get all those things and get something that's really worthwhile, you may have to sacrifice some of your laundry list of, of oh, yeah. features. Because you're going to end up with something that is not what you intended. No. Right. Uh, and and right. if you go on Amazon, there's plenty of yeah. stuff for less than 100 bucks that says it has all those things. 
Can I make a car reference? Sure. Oh, thank God. Uh, think of like you buy a, a a Honda Civic or or a Mitsubishi Eclipse, and then you start putting the we'll call them fascia upgrades. The the you know, we've got a, we've got <laughs> oh, the a body, need for speed underground. We've got upgrades. a body kit. We got a couple of decals. We got a big wing for the back and yeah. a foul uh, roof scoop. Mm. Um, none of these things are going to make your um, your import car go faster or get better mileage. They're going to make it look like something it's definitely not. And the right. same stuff holds true. You know, the more we talk about the internet, the more it's like, it reminds me of like fast food. You pull up to the screen and there's all these great options. And oh, they're very so low professionally cost fit- photographed. Yeah. Oh. And, and then they overfeed you and it's not good for you in the long run, right? <laughs> <laughs> give, it, give us a shout. We'd love to chat. It's uh, true. It's yeah. true. We got to talk about shooting too. Yep. Um, yes. I know Mark would love to just continue talking about hunting. We talked about this before the, the podcast. But okay, so shooting. <laughs> Mark, brings, Mark, we talked about you. Just we not talked about, about hunting all the you. time. Uh, and shooting brings with it then a different set of uh, requirements or yep. preferences that people would want to have uh, for their optic that's going on their top of their firearm. Now, there are optics that are great hybrids. Yep. And a lot of times that's what people want. Uh, or there are optics that are really good at one thing, and if you ever wanted it to do another thing, you're just going to have to take with it the fact that you know there may be a couple drawbacks. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of people out there, for example, hunting with Viper PST Gen twos, even though it's a you know non-locking exposed elevation turret, which you know maybe you might say, oh, it might get bumped. At least it has a zero stop though. Right. Um, but there's plenty of people out hunting with those, which seem more like a tactical long range optic. Um, and so anyway, but when it comes to shooting. Optical quality, I know, is still important. I'd say a lot of people do then start placing a lot more precedence on the turret system. Mm -hmm. What what have you seen, Ryan, in in your experience on the phones and emails and all that? So let's look at the 1-6 to Strike Eagle because this is a cool optic. Um, ARs are very popular, whether it's for three-gun, for home defense, or just the general recreation. They're the four-wheeler of guns. There's a lot you can do with them. Utility, pleasure, et cetera. Um, and we also make a Viper PST Gen 2 1 to 6 and a Razor Gen 2 1 to 6, and now the Razor Gen 3 1 to 10. Mm-hmm. Um, three gun, we'll pick on it specifically, or tactical style shooting competitions like multi gun. Um, very popular. The, the 1 to 6 Razor Gen 2 is and has been one of the most trusted choices in multi gun for years. Before I even came to Vortex, I was running a 1 to 6 Razor uh, because that's what all the pros ran. <clears throat> Can you str- run a 1 to 4 Razor for a little bit? I ran a one to four PST. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yep. Um, the one to six Strike Eagle came out, and I would bet that there are way more of those out winning local matches than there are one to six razors, uh, because it's a Correct. price point and affordability. But we can look at now, like what we're doing with it, and will this optic satiate that need, or will it will it uh, capture the uh, the the things that we require to win this or do this proficiently. And the one to six strike eagle is a great example. Yes, it does. It checks all the boxes. And then you say, well, can I use this for home defense? Well, sure. You turn it to one X and it's got illuminated reticle and drive it like a red dot. Um, and then the thing a lot of other people like to use ARs for is hunting coyotes and fox and things like this. And can you do it for that? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Hogs. Yep. Oh, I forgot about hogs. Yep. We don't have those up here. Those are really, really popular. One to six is a really, Tremendous. really popular for hog hunters. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, an optic that the price point is extremely attractive. Uh, the utility is completely undeniable. Um, fits a lot of roles. Mm-hmm. Now, what does a shooter gain if they go to a Razor one to six? Like, let, let's say we're, we are playing multi-gun and we're taking it really seriously and we're willing to make that investment. What do you get? Um, and from the competitor standpoint, at least the feedback that, that most of us get is, well, you go to a, a, a cleaner reticle in the Razor Gen 2 1 to 6, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we eliminate some of the stadia in there. Um, they're very like uh, intentional holdovers. They're not in the way, but they're certainly not invisible. The illumination is a completely different component. At that point, it, it acts much more like a projection type red dot in which it's very glaringly in your face. Um, and it's built for speed, mm-hmm. huge field of view. I, I would argue that the optical quality is less important in that game than um, the minuscule things that are going to remove tenths of seconds from your time, and that is uh, target ID, 
uh, reticle visibility, holdover points when necessary, um, and then field of view. Uh, and the Razor 1 to 6 wins that uh, category. So yeah. that's where it would be advantageous to do that. If you were going to call up any of the guys or gals at Vortex and say, or write up any of the guys and gals at Vortex and say, hey, I want to start shooting multi-gun, also want to possibly hunt coyotes, would like to keep an AR in the truck or by the bedside, et cetera. Um, do I need the Gen 2 Razor? Well, the answer is no. No. A one to six strike eagle will do a great job. If you, if you call up and say, I'm, I'm willing to make that investment and I do need these things to shave off tents here and there, um, or I'm going to be using this for a law enforcement application or something like that, then we'll start talking about the Razor 1 to 6. Sure. Or you know, the PST 1 to 6. Correct. Yep. I always skip that one. And it's, well, it's, it's, the... it's like, uh, it's, Oh, how do you explain the PST 1 to 6? Because you have the Razor, which is your yep. poster child. It's the uh, Lamborghini poster on a kid's bedroom wall. Yep. And then you have the Strike Eagle, which is at 300 bucks. It's like, well, shoot, I can physically do everything the Razor yep. can physically do yep. for 300 bucks. It just maybe doesn't do it as, you know, impressively. Yep. And in between, you kind of have with middle child syndrome, a really, really good optic in the PST 1 to 6, but it's just, that's what it is. It's just a phenomenal optic for the money. And so, you know, whenever you have something that's just really good at what it does and it's not amazingly spectacular or super expensive or on the kid's bedroom poster or whatever, yeah. it kind of doesn't always um, it's, it's 80% get a ton of, of fanfare. It's 80% of the optic for 50% of the price. Yeah. It is. And there's your diminishing marginal return yeah. thing, right? So you go from, let's say, having iron sights or at $0 having no sights on a, on a gun. Then you go up to, let's say, $700 at the PST 1 to 6, and you've all of a sudden just incredibly increased your potential and your uh, your capability of that yeah. platform. Now double that again and go up to $1,400, have you yet again just like doubled your capability no from the PST to the Razor? No. You kind of realize, oh, okay, is the Razor a little bit better on 1X? Maybe it's it feels a little bit uh, more like a red dot or just in a little bit more impressive apparent field of view or whatever on 1X. And you know, I can tell the optical quality is a little bit better when I crank it up, you know, somewhat, mm -hmm. or I'm at low light hunting coyotes or something. Yeah, I can tell. Is it two times better? No. no. Not even close. No. And then, you know, in between there, like you said, you have the Strike Eagle too. So that's at, at that $300 price point between, you know, nothing and, and a PST 1 to 6. And again, the PST is a little bit over double the price of a Strike Eagle 1 to 6. Is it more than double as good? It's closer to being double as good, yeah. as, you know, than the Razor to the PST. But that's, again, where when you're kind of going from entry to high end, mm -hmm. it's this, what do they call that? It's a... Oh, math class. Even economic classes, we used to use these all the time. You know, oh, yeah. one of those... Uh, no, is that, that's not parabola. Exponential is that curve? a parabola? A pro well, exponential yeah. curve. A curve curve. Yeah. yeah. We'll just call it a curve. One of those Goes up. maths. Anyways, but, you know, as you go up in price, you get yep. these really big improvements yep. at first as you go from entry level to mid-level, and you're like, yeah, everything's getting so much better. And then when you get up to the really, really high end, you're like, okay, it got better, but I had to spend way more to get that much better again, you mm -hmm. know? Yep. Well, and that's why I personally, like, I gravitate towards kind of those middle ground optics because you get the best of both worlds. And, yeah, and, and right sometimes I don't, to... sometimes I don't, depending on, you know, again, I go back to the consequence, not, not, not in a, in a bad way, but like for me, anything I'm going to do with an AR, I can accomplish, you know, with, uh, you know, let's say we're talking about, you know, close to medium range engagements, whether it's hunting or, you door know, kicking door kicking, tactical style shooting, whatever, if I'm ever finished my air. But the PST and the strike eagle are going to suit my needs, yes. right? If I might get shot, like if that's a potential consequence, I'll probably go with the Razor because, you know what, it's worth the extra few hundred bucks. Right. I, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult not to make a, a vehicle parallel. But every, like, I'm not going to say everybody has cars. Most of us as adults have to consider our transportation in, in our modern age, right? And this is a good example of uh, modest vehicle purchase for longevity and needing a supercar or a sports car. And, and one thing I get a lot of guys are like, well, do I need this? And the, the question is like, well, consider your sedan. You're looking at a Honda Accord. It's a great car, a lot of years on the road. Reputation has been uh, bolstered for multiple decades. Four wheels, four doors, you get it black. Goes fast enough to get you a speeding ticket. Um, great car. Porsche Panamera. Sedan, four wheels, four doors, comes in black. Goes 175 miles an hour. 
do you need the ability to go 175? Probably not. Um, the price increase or price differential could be as much as $100,000 or mm-hmm. more. A great contrast and or compare and contrast between something like a Strike Eagle and a Razor 1 to 6. The things that it gains you are probably more of a status or a want than a need for most shooters uh, until you get into things like law enforcement application or things like that. Or racing, you know, yeah, I mean, or, like or uh, literally com- racing. Competitive, three gun, three yeah. Gun, right. yeah. yeah, BRS, um, whatever. At that level. Do, don't don't feel the need to buy a, a Formula One car if if you just like to go fast down the country road, right? Because mm-hmm. that performance threshold could put you through the rail, quite literally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and as usual, too, and I'll just carry on your reference, if you hand the Honda Accord to a Formula One driver, they're going to be able to drive it dang fast. Yep. Faster than you could even. Yep. Yep. And if you hand a professional, you know, three gunner, one of the guys out there that it just, I mean, consistently winning matches, Jerry Mitchell, for example, hand yep. him the Strike Eagle, he will burn down a stage way faster than you ever would. Yep. Than you ever could probably even imagine because that guy has had so much time. We had a podcast with Jerry Mitchell. You should listen to it because you'll actually get into the mind of somebody who is an elite level, I would say the Michael Jordan of three gun shooting. Mm-hmm. Because hearing his mentality and everything that goes into it, all of the practice and all of the visualization of everything, it doesn't matter what's in front of his face, really. I mean, he could probably shoot that thing with, like, two sticks duct taped to the top of his AR rail. Um, (laughs) It helps that he uses Vortex optics. But uh, anyway... (laughs) The dude, though, will absolutely outrun almost anyone out there. And so yeah. when some people, you know, and they think, oh, man, you know, I need to I need to go fast sometimes. So, this, you know, $300 optic, I need the best. It's No, you should probably spend a lot more money on ammunition and time at the range and practicing and actually becoming a really, really good shooter before yep. you can start making claims like that. Yep. Yep. No, I agree completely. So, and then this carries over to the long-range marksman, too. Yeah. Uh you were talking about running the Vortex Extreme with a Diamondback Tactical. Two years in a row. Yep. So I went back and did it again. First focal plane. It's either insanity or it just works perfectly fine. Yep. <laughs> Exposed turrets, um, comprehensive ranging reticle. Did you feel that if you would have jumped on board with a Gen 2 Razor, you would have done better? I would have had a heavier gun. That's correct. Um, but... I, no, I, I physically wouldn't have done better because right. I, as a shooter, physically couldn't have made anything work right. better than I was making it work. Right. I, I could see every target perfectly. Yep. I had no issue. There were times where, Mark, you were using a PST, and this isn't because I'm not calling you snobby or anything, but you were just using a PST, and uh, better optic... <laughs> Better optic, and there were times where I was finding the targets first, or I could see the yep. targets better, whatever, and it was just because my angle, whatever, I happened to find it first, whatever. Um, I could see every target. I could get my reticle on every target. Every time I dialed and shot, I was either very close to the target, which is usually chalked up to me, or the wind out there, because you're in Wyoming in the mountains, and it's crazy windy, and targets are also you know, a thousand yards away or something like that. Uh, or I was hitting the targets. And the last year I went, and every year I've gone, I've hit more and more targets. Yep. And, you know, I, I well, if I would have taken the Razor, I don't. I honestly don't think that I've, I physically would have done any better. Would I have maybe seen the targets a little bit more sharply? Sure. Right. right? Well, I mean, how, that, how sharp the, you see the targets doesn't mean you're going to shoot them better. Is that the ingredient to success? No. No, and I think... I think so many people are missing out on big opportunities because of this FOMO or this misconception that unless you're buying that Porsche Panamera, you can't drive to work in the morning. That's not the case. Right. Like right. the Diamondback Tactical in this instance probably does you more of a service as a, a shooter than the Gen yeah. 2 Razor. Think of all that extra ammo money. Oh, it's yep. true. And then some, I, I know some people brought up the fact uh, you know, it doesn't have a zero stop, a mechanical zero stop. So what I did was I just figured out that from where I was zeroed to when I ran out of adjustment was almost exactly two full revs. Yep. And so what I did the couple of times, or actually I did run into a couple of times where I forgot to dial my turret back to zero after a, a full stage of shooting, and then yep. we show up at the next stage, and all I see is that my turret's on three, and I'm thinking, oh, great. Is that the first three or the second three after I've gone one full rev? And uh, all I had to do was just dial it until it bottomed out and then dial back two revs, and yep. I did that like three times. And you're thinking about 
10 stages over the course of an entire day, dialing the turret up and down and bottoming it out and coming all the way back to zero and then dialing it out again. And on the last stage, I think I hit like, I don't know, five or six times. It was actually kind of a tough stage, difficult angles, but I was still hitting targets when mm-hmm. I was the way when I was dialing them according to my ballistics calc. Yep. Trust trust yep. in the equipment. The other thing was too is yeah, our ballistics calc stuff that we got, we could have gotten far better ballistics information. We were using like both you and I were shooting six five Creedmoors with similar barrel lengths, yep. but we were just using the same ballistic data because and we didn't have a Kestrel on us. We had zeroed the day before and we got all of our ballistics data the day before. The next day was a different temperature and all this stuff was happening. So you can't all you also when it comes to long range too, especially people are real quick to start blaming the equipment. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, hey, let's just look at the conditions. Yep. Let's look at your ballistics, how they change from the last time you were at the range, yep. your location, your elevation, the ammo that you're using, your shooting humidity, position. I mean, it, shooting we, weren't, position. we weren't shooting off a, you know, a cement pad with, you know, no. bipods and squishy bags. And squishy bags. And, yeah. and, I mean, yeah. rocks. Super awkward, you know, high angle, yep. low angle, everything. There's a lot going on there that comes yeah. into play. And I think one thing to point out, Jim, and now... Compared to Ryan, probably compared to you, I gravitate towards a little bit more magnification. Not a lot, but what? a little bit more magnification. Let's, let's dig deep into that, Mark. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, is there something going on? <laughs> buckle up. Uh, but I think I had a top end of 15 power, one less than you, Jim. Mm, yeah, I, one less. Mind you. Uh, you had a top end of 16 power. And when we're talking about missing targets, right? These aren't big targets to begin with. And we're no. talking about ranges, you know, anywhere from, I guess, probably on a low end, generally 400 yards, mm-hmm. on a high end, 1,200 yards. And a lot of those 1,200 yard or 1,000 yard, 12, you know, 8 to 12, you're not missing them by much. Mm-hmm. So it's really... It's a wind call. It's a wind call. It's a this. It's a mirage. It's, you know, yeah. an awkward shooting angle that you're not used to. Um, I guess I'm tying that back into kind of like the magnification argument that, like, you might think you need more than you really do. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I was, I was, and you were. Neither of us had razors. Watching each other's impacts, giving each other calls, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, it's just, uh, I know I, I maybe I have the tendency to get heated about some of this stuff, but I think it's because I see I, I hang out, and it's it's much to uh, at times enjoyable, but at times just makes you want to tear your out because I hang out a lot online, been in yep. social media forums and stuff like that. You know, we've all we all love chatting with our customers we do but sometimes i see people out there just very much interested in a sport they're excited and they throw something out there and they're immediately just bashed you know like oh it's ridiculous for you to think that you could ever do any of these things that we're doing with you know your peasant you know gear you're not using you're not using the most expensive rifle and the latest and greatest developed wildcat cartridge that you're going to have to reload for and buy all this, you know, automated reloading equipment for, and then you need the most expensive uh, optic. That's just, every time I see that happen, I just want to tear my hair out Yep. because it's, it doesn't, it doesn't bode well for the sport, the it, things that we love. I think it robs so many people of opportunity. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Just scares them away. It does. It does. It's very off-putting to go online and and to read these things and to try to come up with a solution when yeah. it's differing opinions. Just because I can't help it. I, and and it, the 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 in the car community, there's they have grassroots. A lot of grassroots stuff is coming up now. And because what you had was there used to be a lot of grassroots stuff back in the Carroll Shelby days, right? I mean, all these hot rodders in California that were just going in their own garage, they'd start throwing different cams and engines and whatever, building up stuff with their buddies, Jim, and then they'd hot, go out and race it. Are hot rodders wildcatters? Basically, yeah. Okay. Uh, they'd go out and they'd race it, and you could do it for, you know, you had a lot of reasonable people that were probably having, you know, relatively blue-collar jobs going out and doing this kind of thing. Well, now you have, I mean... For example, I mean, you look at Formula One, I mean, you got it, and it's always been a little bit that way, but I mean, if you don't have a bajillion dollars and sponsorships coming out of your nose, you're never going to have the chance to race anything like that. And all these other types of racing are just so incredibly expensive to get into. Now you have a lot of the grassroots people coming up that are getting back to the roots of, you can go out and get some really cheap thing and actually go out and just have a, 
a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. Figure it out yourself. Get a couple of buddies together. Buy cheap parts. Scrap stuff out of a junkyard. The whole time, you're probably having way more fun and learning a lot more than somebody who sent it off to a professional racing shop that did all the work while you weren't even there and you were sleeping in you know, your nice, comfortable house and driving to work in your nice, comfortable Porsche Panamera. And then you get back this race car that you have no idea how it works, but you just know it does. You know, whatever. <laughs> all these this grassroots movement is is now it's been really empowering, I think, to a lot of people to realize, oh my gosh, I can do this too. And this looks super fun. And I, 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 maybe there are, and I just, I'm, I'm so, uh, used to just dealing with all kinds of stuff and I, I don't ever pick my head, you know, like an ostrich up out of the dirt or whatever, but grassroots shooting or hunting kind of things. That seems to be, I would, I would hope at least that that's catching some momentum where people realize, you know, we did the classifieds hunter and, you know, the classifieds three gunner and stuff like that. Uh, I really love the idea of, of telling it, people you don't have to be just rolling in it to it's be able a to wild, do this stuff. It's a wild marketplace, though, because look at what a lot of people are jumping into. Like, off, like I want to start hunting. Go buy the most expensive rifle, camel, optic, truck, cooler. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it really is, man. It's really difficult to navigate that that workspace, I think, for a lot of people coming up in it. Because when you do open up the hunting mag, you're looking at, some pretty expensive gear. Mm-hmm. And, and you might be shielded completely from the thing that's actually going to get you a field and keep you a field. Yeah. 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 I think there's no question that, you know, oftentimes better for performance comes with a higher price tag. Yes. Like that's, that's just kind of how it works. Yes. But again, what's the need? Well, in this podcast, let's be honest, this podcast is talking about how to pick out the right rifle scope. I mean, yeah. chances are if you're, uh, you know, listening to this, you're at the point where you probably are a little bit more entry level and, and maybe you have the funds to afford something that's more expensive. And I don't want to poo hoo that either. I don't want to at all tell people that are buying the more expensive gear that they suck, you know, or, Oh, you're so snobby because a lot of times, and there's been times where whatever hobby I'm into, I've gone out and I have then graduated to the more expensive Mm -hmm. thing. And I don't ever want to seem like I'm, you know, poo hooing anybody that's just starting out in it and getting the less expensive stuff. I just think it's important to remember if you are in that case that you had to start somewhere too. And, you know, then if you're not in that case and you are starting out, that's totally fine. And wherever anybody's at is great. You know, it's just that's that's why when we go out and we make a Razor Gen 2, I love the fact that people go and they buy Razor Gen 2s. You know, people who, you know, whatever, they're shooting PRS, they're shooting who knows what. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that people shoot with those scopes. I love the fact because... Those people usually, a lot of them, have been doing this for a really long time. They're giving feedback on some of these really high-end scopes like the Gen 2 Razors for you know future scopes and future optics that we make. The technology from the Gen 2 Razor eventually trickles down into, let's look at the PST Gen 2 that came yep. out. That's using yep. the RZR mm-hmm. Zero Stop from the Razor Gen 1. And, uh, you know, and then it's using some other technologies. It's using the side illumination dial. Mm-hmm. It used to have one on the eyepiece. Now mm-hmm. it uses the side illumination dial like the uh, Gen 2 Razors use. And then eventually that trickles down. Now you have a Diamondback Tactical first focal plane. First focal plane, EBR2C reticle that was out of the Razor Gen 2s originally in the PSTs. And that comes in at 400 bucks. So, so the entry-level people in some ways have the people that are getting the really expensive stuff and pushing innovation and you know uh, giving us feedback and all that. They have them to thank for the fact that they can get a really, really good optic. Yep. They can get that 45-inch LCD screen TV for 300 bucks on yep. Black Friday. But then at the same time, those people buying the Razor Gen 2s, you should be thankful that there's a ton of people out there, way more people than are buying those Gen 2 Razors that you like, buying Dimeback Tactical First Focal Planes for $400 yeah. that have a lot of the trickle-down technology that you love from your scope. Because when they buy those, it lets companies stay in business and yep. keep the lights on and hire more engineers who then can go out and make the really cool, awesome stuff that you really like using. Yep. It's a, it's the circle of life. So I was going to say it's the circle of optics. That's right. where the circle of optics. That's where everybody should be. Everybody should just be cool just, with everybody else being at the position they're at. Yep. In the sport, in the lifestyle, hunting, shooting. Just be cool, man. You know, and conversely, you know, don't beg on the guy that maybe he does have a lot more money than he has time, right? Yeah. Because that guy needs has has need for something that's going to perform at the highest level because. He can't afford to. Uh, he, he, I know what you're I'm trying not to putting say. This right, I'm not putting this. No, right. I, I know what no, you're I trying to say. Mark. I I get what you're if, saying. If if a shooter, okay, so 
in Jim's position of running the Diamondback tactical, if he didn't have two years to refine and shoot and shoot and shoot yeah. and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. I work for Vortex Optics. There's a range here. Yep. I get to shoot all the time. Yeah. yeah. He is in a position that he then has to purchase any, his performance threshold. Any edge he can get, Correct. or that any edge this person can yep. get, I should say. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, get it, man. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's there. It's a real thing. Like, we're not going to send that guy on a sheep hunt with, um, you know, some... Some budget oh, it's your brand first stuff. sheep. It's your first yeah. sheep hunt here. Uh, take the crossfire six to twenty four by fifty out there. Right. It's you know, bad idea. Take the LHT. Right. Admittedly, there are some cases where just it would be foolish to not recommend a really high PC, right. high end PC, right. Game, regardless of what position you're in. Well, and then there is, there is, there is the classic buy once, cry once a little bit. I mean, I think it. You know, you know, I, I think it does hold some water. On that, on yes. that note, yes. though, I think if you not call, all the water, if you call us up. And you tell us the position you're in, whether you're entry or, or expert. We will never try to get you into an optic you think you need to upgrade ever. It doesn't do you any good. No. We're, yeah. So the buy once, cry once thing, to a point, right? To a point. I, yeah. I, I don't think if a lady or gentleman calls us up and says, you know, I want to start doing this or I want to move forward in this, I, we're not going to steer you towards the most expensive thing that we make. Because it's not doing you any good. We're also not no. going to put you at the bottom of the barrel right. with the intention of, oh, you'll buy that, and then you'll think, oh, I need more, and you'll buy this and all that. We, w- there's no trickery here. We want to get you into a lifetime optic. You mm-hmm. buy it, and there, that's where you're at. You could be happy with that for two decades, three decades, yeah. as long as you can pass it on to your great-grandchildren. And how many things do you guys have? And, and I know I have some stuff where it was like the first thing you got, and you still have it because... It worked fine, yeah, and you did a lot with it. Yep, and you kind of appreciate the fact yep. that 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 little old cheap thing is still ticking to this day. Yep, and it's still perfectly fine. Sometimes you still go out and use it. Remington, yep. Remington eight seventy youth twenty gauge. There it is. Yep, my uh, oh shoot, what would mine be? Henry twenty two lever action. Yep, rimfire lever action. Yep, still got it. Mark, do you have a thing? Oh man, I got lots of things. Um, God, dare I say, just because maybe it's always top of mind, the old three hundred Wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Texas with it. Texas. Dare I say? It. Oh, Wisdom, Wisdom, Wisdom. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they're upset by oh, that. Or, uh, or we... my first ever set of Crescent uh, brand sockets. Sure. I still have you that. Got the kit? It still rides in my yep. truck. I did get the kit from Menards that yep. was on sale, and I still have it, and I still beat the living daylights out of it. Uh, every time I use it, I just say, take that. <laughs> we'll bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> but you bought yourself a product that fills a need and does so well, mm-hmm. saved yourself the money. Where did you put those other funds? Oh, in parts that I was going to take off the car and put back, back on. Yeah. Back into your and passion. Learned. Yes. And you became, a better, a ton. you became a better mechanic, a better driver. Mm-hmm. A, a better motorist. Well, and plus you can't figure out. So ne- you know, now I've figured out too. It's like with with tools, with guns, with optics. Yeah. You start using one, and you're like, "This works. It physically accomplishes the task." But after a while, you're kind of like, "Well, I've gotten to the point now where it's actually really annoying when on my sockets they have a really coarse, you know, uh, position between each." click sure you know so like i either you know i just can't ever get in into the places that i need to get it so i want to get one with a really fine you know click to it or something like that. i can't I, I ratchet or something right. to it you know but then all of a sudden you start having preferences yep and when you can have preferences then that's that's where you're in more of a position to say okay now i'm going to go and i'm going to get this piece and upgrade that and i'm going to upgrade that and mm-hmm. sometimes you think nope the one that i got all the way along is actually as good as it gets. Well, and the, and the the more you do something, the more preferences you're going to identify, the more yep. preferences you're going to develop. You know, are you shooting five times a year or are you shooting 500 times a year? Oh, yes. yeah. I, yes. I, I think when I started, like, coyote hunting, for example, like, seriously getting in coyote hunting calling, first thing I did was about a huge scope, like, big magnification, fancy stuff. Over time, I realized... All the stuff you need. Correct. Yes. I'll tell you... It was Quotation a, marks. It was a 6 to 18, and it had a milled out reticle. It was illuminated and had big turrets. Hell yeah. Because nice. I thought that is what you had to do. That is what you need. Because I got on the Just internet kidding. that that's what it was. I got that fast food, and they, they overfed me. Until that coyote came burning at 40 yards, and you said, wait a minute, shotgun would have <laughs> been nice. Bingo. <laughs> and, and over time, over time, I pared down my, my rifle scope choice. 
So now I run a very modest magnification and intentionally because I, if I hunt coyotes, I do it with a call. And most of the time they're at relatively close ranges. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we're going to circle back to this 100,000 times. Go down in magnification. I, I should, we shouldn't say last call Keep yet. Keep going. I'm really warm. I've been getting warm. Okay. So we, we step away Hot from... topic. Yeah. Hot topic. <laughs> step away from the, the misconception that you need more whenever you're going to do this, this rifle scope thing. I love thing. this topic. What's that? I love this topic. Yeah. That's why it's... Step away from the thought that you need more because you don't. You probably need less. Um, assess your budget. Uh, don't think you need to put all your eggs in one basket with this because then we got to start talking about things like rings and ammunition and rifle stocks and bipods mm, and yes. the, death, the death by a thousand cuts. Like mm-hmm, you, th- mm-hmm. you think you're going to hemorrhage quite a bit when you make this purchase of your rifle scope. Just wait till you start looking at the other things that you need to put the rifle scope on your gun. Um, and, and, and they can be more important even than the optic is. Uh, be modest when making your decisions on rifle scopes. I think that's the biggest takeaway. And call yeah. us. We're happy to, to work through this. We don't want to sell you the most expensive thing because it may be absolutely the opposite of what you need. We want to sell you the right thing. This is borderline dovetailing into what I'd, I'd say almost like a last calls thing here. And so I, I'll say one final closing thought from me. You brought up rings. Yeah. Almost wish it would have been brought up earlier. Hopefully you're still listening at this point in time. But, but I will say this, and I will take this to the grave. They can write it on my tombstone. I don't care how nice your optic is. Yep. If it's in crap rings, it will perform like crap. Yep. Um, end quote. Write it on the tombstone. Okay. But but really, I mean, sometimes you, you, you see really high-end rifle scopes, yep. and it was very clear that they they squeezed every last little bit out of their budget, which I totally get because I've been there. They put it all on the optic, you know, they put it all on black, so to speak, and then nothing left over for the rings Mm -hmm. that are the only thing. Rings are like tires on a car, and I know that the car references are just never ending right now, and some people may already just be like ready to throw the radio at the car or something like that. Actually, you're listening to this <laughs> in a car. You're probably listening to this in a vehicle. So anyway, yeah, you can thank the vehicle for playing this and getting you to wherever you're going. But anyway, people, Mark, drive around on bald tires all the time. And I will say this. There are four little tiny contact patches between your multi-thousand pound vehicle and the occupants inside of it, which, let's be honest, are oftentimes priceless. And often, often. <laughs> oftentimes, <laughs> sometimes you don't take it or leave sometimes, it. Sometimes, you know, there's someone anyway, four little tiny contact patches of rubber between all that stuff and the road. Yep. Those are the only things keeping you on the road, keeping you uh, having grip in the snow, in the wet, in the dirt, mud, anything. At speed. At speed. Stopping. Stopping. Those are the only things doing all of those things. And a lot of people ride around on bald tires or they just never pay attention to their, their tires. It's the same thing with rings. The mm-hmm. only things connecting your precision engineered instrument to your and precision your other precision engineered rifle. instrument that's shooting precision instru- engineered instruments. Now I'm saying that too many times. Everything about it is supposed to be precise. Everything about it is supposed to be consistent and just well put together, and if you put it together with just the cheapest things that you could find, you might as well just shoot irons. Yep. You might as well just not even have an optic on top. Yep. It's a it's a, a weight at that point. Yep. That's where I'm at with that. So get quality rings and mount them well too, because again, if you get quality rings even and you just don't mount them right, it's kind of in the same boat too. So Num- pay attention one, to the specs. Number one reason we see rifle scopes come back to us here at Vortex. Yes. Improper mounting, whether that's procedure or rings. Yeah. All right. Still warm, even though I took off that uh, quarter zip. Still warm after that one. Like I said, Jim, hot topic. You're impassioned about this one. You're impassioned about empowering people to make the best optical selection for their rifle, for their application, to suit their needs so Mm -hmm. they have the best experience they can have possible. Correct. In the field, at the range, whatever. And uh, I think it's I think it's an important topic to have, you know. And I, th- I think we're not dogging on high performing rifle scopes. We make a lot of high performing rifle nope. scopes. Yep, exactly. We just want people 
to have the optic that's going to suit their mm-hmm. particular needs. Yep. And luckily, you know, I think as a company, I guess this is, I'll do an ad, a Vortex advertisement, but I think we, uh, we're we put in our a, ads at the back of the podcast. <laughs> instead of the Nobody's front. listening at this point, <laughs> but we, we kind of have a unique lineup of optics, a pretty deep lineup of optics, everything, like I said, like we we're talking about earlier from our entry point to optics that compete at that true top tier alpha class, uh, you know, category. And in some cases, uh, I think it's the best optic available for that application. But, uh, at each one of those tiers, we want to have something that if somebody has $200 to spend on a rifle scope, by God, it's going to be the best $200 that they spent. And if they've got $2,000 to spend on a rifle scope, scope, by God, it's going to be the, the best $2,000 they ever spent. You earned your paycheck today with that one, Mark. That was good, man. I'm moved. <laughs> good stuff. That's what I got. Well, uh, hopefully, everybody out there enjoyed that one. Like we said, this this one, uh, chances are, if you're listening... Maybe at that point now where you are considering a rifle scope and, and you're a little bit new to it, uh, or maybe you've been hunting forever, you're more new to the shooting side of things, you've been shooting forever, you're more new to the hunting side of things, we've seen it all. Uh, as usual, you can always contact us, phone, 800-426-0048, you hit extension 5, you're going to get a guy like Ryan Muckenhern or one of the other many guys down there that he works with. Hit us up at, is it still info at vortexoptics.com yep. on email, hit us up on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the things, Reddit. Uh, even. So we are there to help out. And most of the time when we talk to actual customers in a one-on-one kind of basis, we don't get so heated um, like we did here. We're not going to yell at you. We're not (laughs) going to yell at you. We promise we won't yell at you. We get, the only reason we get heated is because we all love this stuff. We all love hunting, shooting, optics, guns. And uh, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that there's something out there for them. This is not an exclusive sport or lifestyle to get into. There is a chance for everybody to have a ton of fun and do what we all love. Um, So, yes, with that said, hit us up. Uh, There is also at Vortex Nation Podcast on Instagram, too. Um, Yeah, and let us know if we missed anything. If there's anything else you'd like us to talk about, specific to rifle scopes, or if you'd like the similar style of podcast about another topic, we would love to do that, too. So, I think that closes everything out. All right, enjoy. Check your tires, too. Thanks, everybody, for listening. (laughs) Catch you next time. Bye. Bye. I got new tires. (laughs) All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.